<laughs> I get that. It's seven o'clock and I'm going to start the meeting. Yes. Um, welcome and happy new year. My name is Gail McConnell and I am president of the Pines and Prairies chapter of Native Plant Society of Texas. And this is our first uh, general chapter meeting of the year. And um, because we have a large Zoom audience, we're going to switch up things a little bit and hold our general meeting after the presentation. Um, so I'd like to introduce to you Mike McGee, who is a board of director, and he um, is the general host. He is the host for these chapter meetings. Mike? Okay, so let me grab that. Okay, so um you've heard sort of the hackneyed phrase that our speaker needs no introduction and i think that's really the case tonight except for some of you that may be new to the area or from outside the area uh she's extremely well known in the community of folks that are interested in nature in south Texas. so i first met terry when i joined the master naturalist and intern in 2016 she was leading the training of the interns and the first thing I learned uh, from being in those intern class is this is one lady that really knows her stuff. I mean, if it's about nature, she knows a lot about it and a lot of different aspects, whether it's water, interrelations of, in the environment, she's very knowledgeable. And then after a, well, a, a few months in the chapter, I learned another thing about Terry. She was the heart and soul of the Heartwood chapter of Master Naturalist. Um, she was there from the beginning and uh, is a very vibrant, great chapter, a lot of fun, but a lot of what is a great chapter owes uh, itself to Terry MacArthur. Um, so she's been living in uh, South Montgomery County for 50 years. She writes that her interest in mushrooms started uh when she was when they were first starting building her area of the, the woodlands she thought they cut a road and she saw something she found that was very unusual she didn't know what it was something that was growing we can ask her about what in the heck that was uh but that started her on her journey of trying to find out about fun fungi mushrooms and um all about them and She's uh, been a master naturalist for 22 years. Um, she's fascinated with nature in general. Uh, she's uh, extremely knowledgeable in this subject. And since Bob Daly spoke with us in December about microorganisms and in the soil and the biology of soil, uh, Terry stepped up while well, she had a good companion to that. So, with that, I guess. Further ado, that's quite a bit of a do. Uh, <laughs> I will uh, introduce Terry MacArthur and try to launch her presentation. So please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, thank you. So I want to tell you about a phone call I had really recently. A local environmental consultant called me and he had a client who has had fairly recently bought a couple hundred acres right on down 1488 a ways toward Magnolia. And the guys told my friend, the consultant, that um, he had heard that fungi in the soil helped make trees and plants healthier. So he tasked the consultant with finding out what were the most common mushrooms in the area and how he could grow them. What's wrong with those two questions? <laughs> There's a whole lot of them. Yes. What else? What else was wrong with those two questions? They're really? already growing quite well without any of his contribution. You really can't go out and plant them. You can't go out and plant them. You can't really see the, if you want to liken it to a plant, you can't really see the fungal body itself. It's in the soil. But more than that, it depends what kind of ecosystem he has on the property, what trees and plants are already there, because 
Fungi have associations with specific trees in most cases. And what kind of soil does he have? I asked him, has he had a soil test done? Well, I don't think so. Okay, so we don't know what his ecosystems may be on the property. There's no way to predict. But I did go ahead and send him, I did go ahead and send him a list and I'll show it to you in a minute of some of our most common mushrooms in this area um, and the list. I um, link them to the kinds of trees that they are most often associated with. And when I show you the list in a minute, you'll see that I also included what that kind of mushroom's role is. So we'll come back to these questions as we move along. So, Where's my thingy? Uh, red star cherry. Right. And what do I push? Uh, one or the other of the button <laughs> of this one. If you push the blue one. Trial and error. Oops. You just you disconnected. That was not the right button. Oops. Just hammer def, def com. Oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I can hold it. Yes. Now we're in the middle. Oh my God. It's a nice place to be. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Is the is the PowerPoint still open? Yeah, just a second. Um, we lost it up there. It's just okay. We lost it. Well, apparently this gizmo is glitchy that it's, way. Uh, yeah, a little more powerful than we thought it was. Okay. So, so the first thing we're going to talk about is connections, interactions. If you think about it, every single breath we take, every single bite of food we take, all the air we breathe, most all the medicines we take all rely on nature. We call them ecosystem services. They're what keep us alive. And the functions that create those benefits, those ecosystem services, are all of the interactions, all the connections between and among organisms and between and among organisms and the non-living parts of their ecosystems. So it's a fairly complex thing to study. Technology in proves like by the second, if not by the day, by the second. And we're learning more things every day about nature. Well, we still can't even figure out, the collective we still cannot figure out what in the world makes a seed germinate. We don't really understand that process. I read a fascinating report uh, that just came out this past year in the fall. Um, they were studying that exact thing. And they found out a couple of things. And one is that seeds and spores seem to have some level of potassium in the outer coating. And even though the seed dries out and goes dormant, that potassium layer, when it gets signals from the environment, and is that moisture, is that temperature, you know, what is the, what are those signals? The seed outer layer releases a tiny bit of this potassium. And depending on the electrochemical potential that results, whether it's positive or negative, then the seed is likely to try that again when it perceives, and, and they use words like decide and perceives about seeds. When it perceives those conditions again, it releases a, a tiny bit of this potassium. If it gets a positive chemical, electrochemical feedback, it does it more and more often every time it perceives those favorable conditions. But it doesn't jump into germination because it, germination is an all or nothing thing. It's an irreversible decision. Once that seed or spore starts to rehydrate itself and get ready to germinate, it's committed. It can't stop. 
So it's either going to succeed or it's going to fail miserably and die and become just another piece of organic detritus to get broken down and decomposed and worked back into the soil. So they used words like assumed and supposed and unclear uh, in this report. So we're, we're getting there, but we, we, we still don't understand that process. And that's the nature of all of these complex connections and interactions that go on in nature that allow us to live here. And not just us, all life on earth depends on those interactions in nature. So Bob opened, Bob Daly last month, opened the conversation about microorganisms in the soil and how they work together to help support the growth of vegetation. And he brought up the topic of mycorrhizal fungi, mycorrhizal mushroom roots. Yep. They can see it remotely. I'm just trying to get this TV on so you can see it. So that's what she's going to be talking about. Uh, so you keep going so I can get the TV on. When you were looking at the input. Does that need to be an HDMI 2 or does it need to be a PC? Uh, there's, in, we're, we're trying to do it wirelessly. But, and, uh, so the folks online can still hear me talking, though. And they can also see what your this slide. Okay. Okay. But you just can't get it to advance. No. Are we locked up from this? Uh, I, I don't know if that caused it or not. I don't think so. I think I'll just keep, you, keep you going. It. We can advance from here. So. Okay. But, so that's where you are. Okay. That's what it is. And Let's I'm trying see. to get it on the screen. All right. So where, which keys am I using on here? Are they just my arrow keys right here? Yeah. Okay. Works. Just so you know, your video is frozen. Oh, well. Okay. We'll work on that later. Can If you can see the slides, you don't need to see me. It's okay. Thank you, though. Slides are working great. So, so, oh, so here's some considerations. Um, those soil microbes do a lot of work. They, what I call, protect and serve. They actually can make trees, plants, vegetation in general better able to resist herbivores, better able to resist diseases, better, better able to tolerate um, environmental stressors like drought or heat. They help plants and trees get the best nutrition, the best water sources, the best minerals, um, all of the things they need to grow the soil microbes put it all together in a package and present to them in some form or another. Um, and trees and plants make lots and lots of connections with soil microorganisms. So, and fungi are just one of them. Um, what are those other main decomposers? There's bacteria and Bacteria and invertebrates. So easy to remember those three decomposers. Remember, FBI is on the scene when something dies. Fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. They all work together in concert to help protect plants. We used to know that in plants, in, in scientists picked this number of 95% of all plants have microscopic fungi that reside in the leaves.
And she has pretty well proven that trees can recognize their offsprings that grow from their seeds through their connection in this mass underground fungal network. They can recognize their own offspring trees and can manipulate the flow of water, the flow of nutrients to benefit their offspring. Fascinating stuff. I'm still struggling here. Okay. Can Just a second. Uh, hold, hold. Just stand, stand by for a second. Let me see if we get everything going. I'm going to keep talking. If we can't see slides, we can't see slides. So, so here's the thing, guys. How we treat our landscapes has a huge effect on whether or not the soil microbes are available at all and how they connect with us. There, there, there are seven different recognized groups of fungi, but the ones who do most work are broken down to a couple of them, the endomycorrhizal and the ectomycorrhizal. And as the names imply, some grow around the roots of trees. The ectomycorrhizal grow their um, hyphae, which are the root-like structures that grow out in a, in a fungus. They grow around the roots of trees, while the endomycorrhizal actually penetrate into the root system to the cellular level. Um, there's a whole family of endomycorrhizal fungi. They're in the family um, Glomeromycota. They're called arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. When they grow into the cells of the roots, they form little nodules that are called arbuscules. And that's where the fungus and the tree exchange whatever they're going to exchange. So thinking about trees, you know, what do trees do all day? They photosynthesize. So they're creating some of their own food through photosynthesis, but that's not all the food they need. And trees are great carbon sinks, but they're not very good carbon banks because everything that takes in food has to give off waste. And in trees, they exude their waste through the root system into the soil. And that includes a lot of the carbon that they take in, gets exuded into the soil. So they're not banking it very well. But guess who loves that carbon, those carbohydrates that the tree is making all day that it has in excess that it exudes through the roots? Guess who wants carbs for their food? Fungi. So it's to, it's to their advantage to grow around the roots, be there first in line, capture those carbs that they want, that carbon. But the fungi that grow into the roots and form those little organisms inside where that's where the exchange takes place, they're sending nutrients, especially things like nitrogen and phosphorus, they're sending those directly into the tree's roots. And in return, they're taking the carbon and the carbs, the starches back from the tree for their food. So it is, it is a win-win situation. Everybody wins. And other fungi are out here working to decompose. Uh, they break down things in a way that make those nutrients more bioavailable for the trees to use because they're not very good at taking them in by themselves. So those fungi interact with the Mycorrhizal fungi, bacteria play a big part. Ecosystems differ. The network in the soil of a forest is different from the network of the soil in the soil of, of a meadow or a prairie. Forests are more acidic. 
bacteria are, are okay to a degree, but that's not their favorite soil to live in. So the fungi tend to be the dominant, the priority networker in forests. But in a prairie with less acidic soil, there are fungi there and they're doing their job, but the bacteria are the primary mover and shaker for moving nutrients around, breaking them down and making them available. So back to that guy's question, you know, we don't know what kind of soil he has. So we don't know what are likely to be the main networkers there. And we don't know what kind of vegetation he has. So things like um, decomposers like ammonita. So can they see this now? Remotely they can. In the, in the classroom, which you've got to that little tiny screen, oh. remotely they're okay. seeing. All right, great. Where they are. Well, let's catch up here a little bit. I'm afraid to push the button. Nope. Yeah. Here, here we go. Uh, there. Okay, so, well, we've kind of talked about most of this. So here, I was, I was out with a group on a mushroom walk. Um, back in the fall. And um, one of the people there was moving around some leaf litter to, to see if this, where it was kind of in a bunch might have a mushroom hidden underneath. And if you can see that on the screen, he picks this up and he said, Terry, is this fungal growth? And it was. So if you could see into the soil for a glimpse of what that underground network of fungi looks like this is what it would look like we can't see it but this is what it would look like i mean yeah i'm sorry is that hypo threads that we yes see? Okay. yes that's exactly what it is and that's i mean miles and miles of it in every square inch of soil literally miles and miles of it it's so fine that it's really packed into the soil but that's what's moving all those nutrients and all that water around. These glomeromycota mushrooms I mentioned earlier, the, the ones that are endomycorrhizal, they have another great feature to them. As they grow their hyphae through the soil, the, the tips of the hyphae are covered with this kind of sticky stuff uh, called glomalin, and they glom on to bits of soil as they grow through there and they cause them to stick together. So all these bits of mineral and soil that stick together leave holes in the soil so that oxygen flow is better, so that water flow is better. So they're actually engineering the soil besides the work they do to move nutrients and water around. They're actually engineering the soil to make all those roots that are anywhere near where they're growing a lot, lot healthier. I mean, it's a, I don't know. I, I get very excited about it. So here's that list. I, you're not gonna be able to see it on this little screen. Um, actually, I brought a hard copy just to refer to myself and I'm gonna hand this to you to pass around. Um, so these are some of the most common mushrooms of our area. And what I've included on there, as I told you earlier, is um, its edibility, its name, uh, what it associates with, and what role it plays. So as you look at that list, you'll see that some mushrooms can be decomposers, but they can also be parasites. We don't know what makes them change from one to the other, but here's an interesting fun fact. The largest single living organism in the world is a single mycelium growth up in the Northwest. I've heard scientists guess it's age anywhere from 2,500 to 5,500 years old. It's huge, covers a couple of thousand acres, or, or I think it's acres, it might be square miles, but it's huge. It's in the family Armillaria. Locally, I know you've seen Armillaria because when the weather conditions are right and the soil temperature is right, near trees, you'll see this in the morning, you'll see this little clump of several 
mushrooms come up. They're all in a group. They start out very tiny, little, little mushroom caps. They're very light tan colored. You can almost watch them growing by the afternoon going into the evening. They will already be decomposing right before your eyes. So they've gotten bigger and now they're starting to turn into this black gloppy goo. They're wonderful decomposers, but sometimes they kill the plant. I have had them in my yard when I lived on the other side of the freeway from the woodlands. I've had them come up in my yard. If they came up near a tree, if I caught them early enough in the morning, I'd snip off those tiny little caps and I'd go in and I'd make spaghetti sauce because you have to cook that particular kind of mushroom a really long time. So I'd put a pot of spaghetti sauce on to cook, let it simmer for a few hours with those mushrooms in there. They're pretty good. You wait any time later in the day as they mature, they become certainly not poisonous, but but you probably don't want to eat them. But I've also had them come up in my yard next to my viburnum. And the mushrooms pop up in the morning. By the time I get home from work at night, literally that day, all the leaves on my viburnum have turned brown. They're a powerful parasite. So what is the difference? Why are sometimes they're a decomposer? Sometimes they're a parasite? Okay, that's some, another thing none of us know. But they are in the family that is the largest single organism in the world. And they're powerful decomposers when that's how they act. Locally, the one we have that I just described to you is tibescens. So it's Armillaria tibescens. It's called the ringless honey mushroom. Um, you wanna use caution because there's another little clumpy mushroom. It's commonly called sulfur tufts that will definitely make you very ill if you eat it. And it kind of looks the same when they first pop up in the morning. So here's my word of caution. Unless you really, 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 really know the mushroom, don't eat, don't eat mushrooms. Don't pick them. If you touch them, wash your hands. Because also on this list is one of a family of Killer mushrooms called Ammonida. Um, they have common names like destroying angel and, you know, <laughs> other phrases that tell you that if you eat them, sometimes you have two choices. And sometimes those two choices are death or a liver transplant. <laughs> Most times, by the time you're sick enough to see the doctor, that second choice goes away. They kill you. Uh, there's been some work done, especially in European countries, believe it or not, with milk thistle. Some doctor developed a way to create an injectable high dose of milk thistle and have saved some people who have eaten ammonite mushrooms in error, uh, but certainly not all. So ammonites are very dangerous, but there's a lot of other mushrooms that look like them that are edible. So I say again, unless you really, 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 really know the mushroom, don't even touch it, okay? It's the safest way to go. So here's this list. It's interesting. We, uh, If you wanna look up some of them, I brought books tonight. Uh, these are some of my favorite books and I'll show them to you here in a minute. I don't know how we're doing on time. Why won't it advance now, Mike? Um, I don't know how we're doing on time. <clears throat> Try to speed this up here for you. So here's a couple of, so this, I'm just, what am I doing, right clicking? Yeah, one minute. Oh, oh, I see, okay. So this is one of the ammonites you most often see in our forest, it's muscaria. It's um, it's a beautiful mushroom. This is the one that artists have uh, loved for centuries, and you see it in all kinds of art. Uh, this one is an entoloma. If you look, the mushrooms that are in the back, 
are the standard stem and cap enteloma. That's what enteloma normally looks like. The one in the front have been infected by another mushroom that caused the enteloma to abort its growth. And so you end up with these lumps instead of a regular looking mushroom. This is not a mushroom. Anybody know what this one is? Indian pipes, yes. So you'll notice they're pink. They have no chlorophyll. They can't photosynthesize. So where do they get their food? Mycorrhizal fungi. Absolutely right. Mycorrhizal fungi. Can you hear it? Yeah. No, but it's in the ears. And so what is this? Lichens. So what are lichens? So we used to think it was a fungus and a and a bacteria or an algae. How the hell did I get the volume? Guess what? It's typically mm. only one cyanobacteria or one algae, typically, but there can be thousands, thousands of fungi associated with. It. That's why there's so much variety. You look at lichens. Oh my gosh, the variation is incredible. And it's because of the association. So what happens is the algae is the photosynthesizer. It's making the carbs, feeding itself a little bit. The fungus is helping protect it by co you know, covering it over, keeping it protected. And it feeds on the uh, carbs that the algae exudes. So it's that same symbiotic relationship. That benefits both. I just, I want the. So we're dwelling on fungi for a couple of reasons. They are critical to that recycling of nutrients. They're very critical to that recycling of nutrients. When you think about it, what's in a tree that we don't have any wood in this room. What's in a tree that makes it so hard? What does the cellulose wrap around? Starts with L. Lignin. And what's just about the only thing that can break down lignin? Fungi. So the tree dies or a limb falls off. If it weren't for fungi, the entire forest system could crash because the ground would be so covered with dead material, nothing new could grow. So the fungi start that breakdown of the lignin, start softening that wood. Here come the bacteria, here come the invertebrates. They, they do their part in breaking it down. Yeah, it's not an overnight process, but without them, it wouldn't happen at all. So we've got to have them to, to start that recycle of nutrient thing that goes on. So when you go out in the forest and you see some dead wood on the ground and it's covered with those little fan looking, um, thin leathery little mushrooms, they're some of the hardest working decomposers out there in the forest. So give them their respect. Let's not diss those, those mushrooms that are breaking down stuff. Um, so the question is, are fungi plants? Here's some facts about plants. So plants use chlorophyll to photosynthesize. Their food is sugar, starches, and carbon. They store their energy in starch molecules. The cell walls contain cellulose and they need help externally to take in nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen. So are fungi animals? Well, animals can't make their own food. They have to ingest it and digest it. They store their energy in glycogen molecules and their membranes contain cholesterol. So what are fungi? Well, they can't make their own food either. They have to ingest and digest. The way they do that is as those hyphae grow out, all of the action is at the tip of that hyphae. It's got all of the 
uh, moisture there to give it strength to push through the soil, but it's also got all of its chemical components there. They are so adaptable, they're growing through the soil and they encounter a dead insect. They instantly retool their, all those chemical compounds they, that they exude to this dead insect, literally liquefy it, and then absorb through their outer layer the nutrients from that insect, send them back through the hyphae to a place where there's a connection with the tree. The fungus says, hey tree, I got some nitrogen, you want it? And the tree says, oh yeah, man, send it on over. Hey, I got some carbs, you want them? Fungus says, yeah, man, I'll take those all day. They did a study a few years ago. It's, it's been about a decade ago now. Because springtails, a very common soil insect, love fungi. So some of the foresters were saying, wow, we've got a lot of springtails in our soils. I wonder if there's enough that they could damage the, so the fungal network. So they did an experiment, they grew some little white pine seedlings and they introduced the fungi, got it growing in the soil, and then they introduced springtails. Every time the springtails got to one of the samples where the fungus was lacaria, when they ate it, they died. Every time they ate it, they died. Turns out lacaria mushrooms put out some kind of hormone, pheromone, that signals to soil insects, hey, launch over here. And when they come to start eating it, the toxins kill the insect. The lacaria grows its hyphae up, it liquefies the insect body, it absorbs up all those nutrients, says to the tree, hey, I've got some nitrogen. In the studies they did, and it was repeated, within the last five or six years, a different group repeated it with some other um, plants. Within two months, 25% of all the nitrogen in those pine seedlings came directly from the bodies of the springtails. Wow. Nitrogen is so, so critical because nitrogen is part of what the trees and plants use to photosynthesize. It breaks down the carbon dioxide. So what happens in a climate change situation where we have excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? That means trees and plants have to use more of their nitrogen reserves to break down the carbon dioxide. Okay, well, if they've got it available, but here's the problem. For things like bees, the nitrogen in pollen is their only protein source. Bees do drink some nectar for energy, but for health, for growth, for the health of a hive, they've got to have that nitrogen-rich pollen. They have to have that, especially toward the fall. They have to be able to collect that nitrogen rich pollen to feed, to feed their larvae over the winter when there's not enough pollen out there. And now we're seeing in virtually every single plant they've tested right now with such high levels of carbon dioxide in the air, the nitrogen levels in pollen is dropping fast. It's not healthy enough. It's not enough food. The protein level isn't there to maintain healthy pollinators who use that pollen for food. Of course, that's not the only problem pollinators have, but guess what? It's one of them. So here's fungi. They have to digest and ingest their food. They store their energy in glycogen molecules like animals do, but their cell walls contain cellulose like plants do, but the cell walls also contain chitin. Tell me something about chitin. Yeah, there's actually a skeleton on bird hamburger. 
Yes, that's that hard shell exoskeleton on insects. So it's pretty tough stuff. And it's in the cells of fungi. What that means is, if you want to eat mushrooms, and my gosh, they are so full of nutrition. Why wouldn't you want to eat them? They're wonderful to eat. I love, especially when I find a few of the wild ones that I trust to eat. If you eat them raw, it, it won't hurt you and they'll taste good. But that chitin prevents your gut from being able to break them down for you to get the nutrients. So it's kind of like empty calories when you eat raw mushrooms. You can eat them and they taste good, but you're not getting the nutrition. So the way to get around that is to heat the mushrooms. In other words, cook them. If you cook mushrooms, it breaks down that chitin. And now you get all the nutrients from the mushroom. So thing to remember. Before shellfish, allergies have problems with you know, hardly anybody is allergic to mushrooms. Hardly anybody is allergic to mushrooms. It's kind of like honey. I mean, there's virtually nobody allergic to honey. And hardly anybody is allergic to mushrooms. All right, so fungi membranes also contain ergesterol. Ergesterol is a steroid alcohol that converts to vitamin D when it's exposed to sunlight. So, you know, those mushrooms you're fixing to cook? even if they're the white button mushrooms from the store, set them out in the sun for a few hours during the day to take up some sunlight and it breaks down that ergesterol, the vitamin D level shoots through the ceiling. So now they're twice as nutritious as they were before. You get a good shot of vitamin D. There we go. So we haven't ever put a dollar value on what those microbes in the soil do for us. But we'd find out real quick that we can't live without them if we don't have them. A couple of things that you can do to help keep your soil and your landscape healthy enough. Number one, don't use synthetic chemicals in your yard. Don't do it. For Reasons we could spend another hour talking about. Use compost, use organic growing methods. Don't plant invasive species. Okay, what happens when a non-native gets introduced into an ecosystem? What happens? It can overuse resources, but what's the first thing that happens? It changes the soil. This tree in this place, in this soil, with this decomposer community and these soil microbes have co-evolved for eons. Someone new comes in. Yeah, it has those advantages. It doesn't bring its diseases and insects with it. So it has a slight advantage to outcompete. But that's not the problem. Eventually, it's going to drop its leaves. These soil organisms have no connection with that plant. They have no prior interactions with that plant. They have no way to adapt quickly enough. So the first thing that happens is the soil organisms begin to drop out because now things that may even be toxic to them are in the soil. Another thing is the invasives grow their root system a lot faster to put on more growth faster because of lack of competition. So they've got more leaf mass. What about transpiration? You know, our natives are adapted to our weather, our climate, they stay alive by transpiring, releasing small amounts of moisture through the leaves. That keeps the flow of moisture from the roots up to the leaves. Keep, that's what keeps the tree alive. I mean, think about it like your blood flowing in your body. If your heart stops pumping, you don't last long. Well, if trees can't keep that one cell thick layer 
of living cells that's right under the bark moist, that tree is not going to last long. So as the trees transpire, that's what keeps that water moving. Well, invasives put on extra leaf matter. So if, if a mature oak transpires 150 gallons of water a day, something like a tallow or some large invasive tree is probably transpiring 350 gallons of water a day. Sucking that moisture out of the soil, it's going into the atmosphere. Will it get it back eventually when it rains? But right now, it's depleting resources for the rest of the forest that's around it. So invasives are bad guys. Try to keep them out of your landscape. If you, there's an exotic you absolutely love and have to have, could you grow it in a big pot and not put it in the soil to, to uh, damage the ecosystem's balance there? Uh, Eo Wilson said the 21st century is destined to be known as the century of the environment. We are fast approaching end of the first quarter century, and I am not feeling it. But we, and I mean we, can help change behaviors. All of us have enough knowledge to talk to people in our circles of influence and help change behaviors. Help them understand how important what nature does for us is. We can't breathe without nature. We can't eat without nature. And most of our medicines come from nature. If we don't take care of nature, it's not going to take care of us. So help other people understand the need to take better care of the environment, or else we're going to end up like the words in the song by Seether. I am prepared now that everything's going to be fine one day too late. And maybe that's just as well. I don't know. Uh, here are some books I recommend. They're over here on the table. Uh, we could talk more about them, but I think we kind of got to a slow, slow start. Um, if you want to talk more about mushrooms, there's my contact information. I would love for you to text me, call me, email me. If you have questions, if you want to send me your photos and we can try to help ID them. Okay. I'll tell you what they are. I'll look them up for you. Bonus. Guys, anybody have a question for me now? I know we've run over. No, that's fine. Uh, either here or uh, are you monitoring the chat? Yeah. So yeah, take some. Yeah, go. I don't. I don't. I have a question. question. Yeah, take some questions. You got a question? Yes, please. please. There you go. Ah, uh, that's what I was going to ask as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there any organized? Uh, All right. So, so to see mushrooms, we have to have a combination of soil moisture and soil temperature not air temperature, soil temperature for most fungi to fruit. And that mushroom is strictly the fruiting body. It's just like an apple on a tree. It's just the fruit. So yes, we've had a lot of moisture and we had that little cold snap, but now we're back at 80 degrees again. Um, Right now, what you're mostly going to see is those uh, usual suspects that pop up in your lawn, in your grass after a rain that are lepiota. You do not want to eat lepiota, trust me on that point. Um, they won't kill you, probably, but <laughs> after three, four days of vomiting and diarrhea, you may wish you were dead. I'm just saying. Um, I have not seen... I have not seen any good edibles out there. If we decide to have a little bit of winter and the temperatures stay constantly a little bit lower than they have lately, I will, I will definitely set a mushroom walk. We did one right here for Heartwood chapter six, eight weeks ago, something like that. Um, and we, I mean, it was so dry then we couldn't find anything. Now it's so wet, I don't know what we'd find out there. But guys, if you want to do this, I'll be happy to let Gail know as soon as I set a date for a mushroom walk. I'll be happy to let you know. And if this is your preferred place, we can try to come here and do that. Happy to do that. Other questions? Anybody else? I heard, I was watching something the other night. And it said, they said they thought the first multicellular organisms were fungi. 
Fungi are in the fossil records of more than 400 million years ago. Fungi are the reason we have terrestrial plants. Mm -hmm. When that first algae washed up on a beach where fungi existed, and that initial association, that relationship was born, mm -hmm. the fungi helped provide that algae with some nutrients and the algae photosynthesized and they started their exchanges. Fungi are the reason we have terrestrial plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question you got me thinking about my practice of gathering up my neighbor's leaves for mulch. Should I be inspecting their yards for invasives? And if it's got too high a load of, of let's say, non-native trees, deciduous trees that just pass them by, is there a point? Is If there's too many non-native trees, will that mulch be harmful to the soil? So the short answer is it could be. I mean, it really could be. Depends on what the mix is. You, you know, I always tell people if you want to, if you're going to go somewhere and buy mulch, go somewhere you know sells native mulch, native mulch, or buy some, buy compost that's composted native mulch. Because the, you know, the composting process will, the, the heat buildup will help kill weed seeds and that kind of stuff, but it's not going to compensate for non-native leaves to as much degree maybe as is needed it depends on the on the mix so so yeah i'd be cautious i mean you don't want to rake up tallow leaves and put them <laughs> in your beds yeah. no i have a question on the tallow. they say jeremy says i cut down the water roof in my yard last fall and left many of the log i've seen at least four or five species of mushrooms hey jeremy were these already present in the soil and waiting for something to decompose? The, the answer is most likely yes. Um, in an oak, depending on how old it was, the chances are very good that they were already inside beginning to decompose the heartwood. That's what how fungi grow, as they grow into the roots. So let's face it, the only living cells in a tree are that one cell thick layer right under the bark. Everything else inside that is either dead or dying and turning hard into wood. But fungi invade trees that way and begin to decompose. That's why red cockaded woodpeckers can live in living pine trees, but the pine tree has to be old enough, 40, 60 years has to be old enough for red heart rot fungus to have already invaded the heartwood of the tree and begun to decompose it and soften it. I mean, they, you know, they got hard heads and they can really drill on those trees, but to create that nest cavity, they can't do it in a younger tree. The inside isn't soft enough yet. So that's how red cockaded woodpeckers manage to nest in living pine trees. So yes, Chances are excellent. It was already living in the tree or at least in the root system of the tree. And now it's doing its job, breaking it down. And he continues to say it was a 70 to 80 year old tree. Oh, then for certain. It was probably hollow inside already. Yeah. I've got a couple of textbooks and I, I think of some of the ID for edibles or just general identification of fungi is appearing in apps on the phone. Are there any that you like that you use that are better than others at deciphering what we're looking at? I'm sorry, baby, I'm an old person. I don't use apps. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got fungal guides. <laughs> yeah. Some of those apps are not good. I had a plant that was about three or four foot tall in my yard. And I did the thing, they told me it was a fern. Mm. <laughs> well, um, so someone I was with on the mushroom walk was had their phone out and they are uh, they weren't using iNaturalist. They were using something Seek. else. Oh, Seek. Seek, yeah. Seek is what they were using. And they took a photo, really nice, really good photo of it and submitted it. And it came back and said it was a mushroom. <laughs> so I'm not saying they can't correctly identify, but. To correctly identify a mushroom, it's more than looking at the cap. 
It's looking at the gills or the sp pores, if it's a um, foliage. It's looking at the stipe. It's looking at the base. And for an extra bonus of getting it right, it's also about making a spore print and comparing the spore color. Um, you know, the spores are microscopic, so you can't just look at them. So the way you know what color the spores are is cut the cap real near the cap, cut the stem off, take the cap, put it gill side down on paper, put a bowl or a cup over it, leave it overnight, and in the morning, carefully lift it up. And on mass, you can see the spores enough to determine what color they are. That's a really determining factor. Yeah, there's some chemical tests you can do too, but I'm not saying don't use an app. I'm saying don't eat the mushrooms. <laughs> Unless someone you know that you trust to correctly ID tells you that's what it is. Well, there's the rub. It's hard to find that person. It is hard to find that person. <laughs> it is hard to find that person. <laughs> well, okay, so... You know, full disclosure here, there are only three or four kinds of mushrooms that I will eat because there's so many lookalikes, so many of them. So, you know, I have my little favorites. And if I can't find those, I'll break down and go to the store and buy the little button ones. Back. And they all have the same amount of nutrition? Oh, probably not all the same amount, but they all are very nutritious. Fungi are. The, because of their chemical makeup, they are antibiotic, antifungal, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and they have some proven regenerative value. So to make sure I get the benefits of all that, I take mushroom extract capsules every day, have for years and years. Yeah. And I started taking them because I had a lot of arthritis. I had a lot of arthritis in my hands. So I started taking the mushroom capsules. I'd probably taken them six, eight weeks at the most. And one morning I got up and I started to comb my hair and I realized my hands don't hurt anymore. So I've stuck with them. I take mostly, uh, I take a combination of them, but it's mostly reishi mushrooms. One of the most highly prized mushrooms medicinally in Asia. So we- are some mushrooms you can get? That you take them, you may still hurt, but you don't care. Anymore. There you go. <laughs> and and there's a lot of study going on with those mushrooms. Yeah. And they're finding. Medical, medicinal studies. Yeah. Yeah. Studies of those in the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most people did. Yeah. There's. Uh, in fact, looking at this room, there are a few of us who aren't old enough to remember those days. So, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to read something that came to the chat. I don't know who AM is. But okay. I think it expresses what we feel about you. Oh, dear. It says, thank you so very much, Terry. I love your talks. Never want to miss one. I always learn something. You are the very best. <laughs> thank you for giving your time and passion, and you are an inspiration. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure to be here. For those of us who can't see the screen, oh, that's okay. because I'm in front. I'm no, sorry, I'm no, 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 no. Do we have your email? Yes, it's long but it's easy. Texas, spell out Texas, nature lover at earthlink.net. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking found a really pretty mushroom in my yard a year or so ago. I've never seen it yet. Well, send it to me. Oh, yeah. So that, 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 yeah, that mushroom that I found when they were starting to cut roads to create what's now the woodlands, I turned the corner and I, I mean, to stop me in my class, it was this orange columns that kind of connected at the top with this white egg looking, eggshell looking base. The snake horns? It was a stink horn. It was a column stink horn. Oh, column and so I said to my husband, now deceased, I said, take me to the bookstore. So I start looking through field guides. And I, you know, I'm looking through field guides. I know it's something growing. Finally, I had picked up the Metzler's field guide to Texas mushrooms that's over here, which is now out of print. And the only way you can find it if somebody's selling it used on the internet. And I start flipping through 
that there it is. And it's a stink horn. And I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. That was way back in the 70s and spent years studying mushrooms. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay. Um, this concludes the presentation part. And if you are not a Pines and Prairies member, um, we invite you to join us um, on npsot.org. Um, otherwise, we are going to convene a chapter meeting at this time, and it is uh, 8.01. And the this is an important meeting for us because we are uh, nominating uh, people for four uh, board positions. And I'm going to ask Carson Stokes, who is our nominating committee chairperson, to announce the, his slate of nominees. And then we'll take nominations from the floor. Yeah, the, uh, the slate of nominees that we have for um, the 2023 Pines and Prairies uh, Board of Directors, uh, President Gail McConnell. Well, uh, yeah, I guess yeah. There, there, are, there are people watching. It's creeps me it's out. Just, people want me. I, I get the feeling people are looking. At me, yeah. These are two year terms, so I'm not. So you can't hear. I'm not up for election. What's that? I'm not up for election. It's by, uh, Martin Treasure and these two. Oh, okay, right. So, um, well, I, well, I'll mention everybody. Of course, who we're going to vote on, right? Going to vote on everyone. So, uh, Vice President uh, Martin Simonton, Treasurer April Smith. She's not, I believe, not here tonight. Uh, two directors at large, Abby, is it NC Henderson? She's, I think, having a having birthday today, and David Lemons. So are there any other nominations from the floor on any of these positions? Our bylaws um, have uh, require a staggered board, and these are two-year terms. So these folks have stepped forward to take a two-year term um, to lead the chapter. Okay. So are there any other nominations from the floor? Anyone that would like to serve and um, stand for election? Okay. If not, um, I will close nominations and your slate. I, I guess we'll make a motion to accept the slate as presented tonight. Right. Thank uh, you. Uh, okay. So if I could have a motion to accept the slate of nominees. Thank, thank you, Mindy. A second? Okay. Thanks, Amy. So that was Mindy Poldrack and Amy Birdwell seconding. All in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you. The elections by our bylaws will occur next meeting in February. That's um, February 15th. It's a Wednesday. And, um, and, uh, we expect that Mike McGee will be the speaker at that meeting, and he will make the case for natives and uh, give you some really good reasons to give your friends to uh, plant native plants. Um, I want to, before I close the meeting, I want to introduce Jaden Kelly. Jaden is the new educational co coordinator or at, at the Jones Forest. And um, he'll be calling on uh, Master Naturalists and hopefully our chapter to assist him in putting on programs for uh, youth at the, at the forest. Um, basically, classroom without walls and maybe so some of the youth and adult, any sort of program. I'm okay. happy with it. I have more experience with youth, but I'm happy to do these mushroom walks, bird walks, all sorts of fun stuff, <laughs> plant IDs. It's okay. That's great. Okay, and so um, this is, does anyone have anything else to add? Let me just say that on Saturday next week, we are going to the um, Houston Audubon Native Plant Nursery, and that's um, down in Houston at the, the Edith Moore Sanctuary, and it's um, very close to Beltway 8 and I-10. Um, <laughs> The uh, volunteers there grow native plants from seeds, but they don't use any amended soils. And uh, it's very, very interesting to see. So if you, um, there's a sign up genius with the last announcements um, that I sent out to you, I think yesterday. 
So <laughs> if you would please sign up. Um, if you want to carpool or if you don't care to drive, just send me a message and um, we'll arrange things so that you can get to go. Okay. Can I make a pitch for my uh, water lab coming up Saturday? Absolutely. So in my role as water conservation specialist for the township, um, I partner with Texas Parks and Wildlife to offer a certification program for people to become certified Texas waters specialists. Um, I mean, what wouldn't you want a certificate from Parks and Wildlife, you know? Um, so it takes eight hours of training based on a water curriculum booklet that they put out. So I work a lot with high school students on this, but anyone can do this, especially if you're a master naturalist that you report your hours into the chapter, you re report your hours in for this, just like you would for any other advanced training thing. But Saturday down at the Recreation Center at Rob Fleming Park, which is in Creekside from 8.30 to 8.30 to 12.30. Yes, I think that's right. 8.30 to 12.30. No, till 11.30. I was right the first time. It's a three hour class. Um, so we'll be looking at a couple of different aspects of water. I try to do a water lab almost every month. And then I do an online two hour class discussion once a month. So if you want to get the eight hours of training in, it counts for master naturalist hours, plus you can get the certification. So if you're interested in water, let me hear from you and I'll get you into the class on Saturday this month or the next one is February 25th. Okay, and um, before you leave, real quick, sorry, two minutes. Martin Simonton's on in Zoom. Martin, do you want to start your video? And I promised that you could say a minute's worth of introduction. Martin has been our vice president and chairperson of programs, and he is the owner of New World Botanical, and it is where we are propagating plants for um, learning how to propagate plants and caring for plants for our plant sale. Um, our last two plant sales have been at Morton's uh, New World Botanical in Montgomery. Um, can he share his screen? Martin, can you put your video on? Mm, I, I can try. The bandwidth is very low and unstable. But... That's all right. Then do you want to... Can just say share, can you share your screen martin oh he doesn't need to share his oh screen. He's he's a, yeah so is there anything that you want to say to the membership martin you're the nominee for a vice president for another two years and we really yeah we really thank you for so, your so a little, oh I've, I've no I've, I've really enjoyed it um so for the people that don't know me, I, I grew up on a ranch here in Montgomery, um, which I've known uh, all the native plants uh, my whole life. My background was forestry science originally before I got into uh, the nursery business, which I've been in the nursery business 25 years, landscaping for 30 or almost 30. Um, we have 50 acres here where the nursery is, which of course, uh, a lot of volunteers come out and we, we propagate native plants. We just got a new greenhouse up and I've done a lot of conservation work as well across the state. Um, that's about it. <laughs> and Martin was recognized for his efforts for native plants by the Native Plant Society of Texas this past year with the Lynn Lowry Award. So um, thank Martin a lot. He um, speaks botanical names of plants so that we all know exactly what plant he's talking about. And if you go on, if you are privileged to go on a plant walk with him, um, he'll point out a lot of these plants and give you the botanical names. And um, Charles Peterson is also here, and I know that he could pretty well do the same. 
<laughs> but, <laughs> but we hope to have you do some of the plant walks as well next year. Okay. And um, thanks, Martin. Um, can David Lemons put on his video and introduce himself? Hi, Gil. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm not going to have a video tonight, but uh, I'll be able to unmute myself at least. Uh, so my name's David Lemons. Um, I've been in the horticultural industry for the last seven or eight years. I started working at Plants for All Seasons. Um, and then I moved over to Nature's Way Resources, where I found out more about native plants and met a great group of people there where we started this uh, Pines and Prairies chapter. And um, I'm currently working at uh, Living Wild Landscapes with Abby, as well as a place called Zero Waste Houston. Um, at Living Wild Landscapes, we do native landscaping um, and we also do wildlife habitats. And at Zero Waste, that is a uh, compost pickup service where we pick up food waste um, throughout the greater Houston area. Um, so yeah, uh, nice meeting everyone. And that's pretty much all I've got for now. Thank you, David. All right, so it is 8.12. I apologize for keeping you over, but I enjoyed being with you tonight and um, thanks for coming. Yes, Kate. I'm in the, the program to become an naturalist. Uh -huh. uh, does good. this lecture count toward my hours? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. We'll be advanced, advanced. Right. As, Yes, single presentation. <laughs> okay. Um, and if you come out to, um, besides, if you come out to Martin's place and work and learn, and then you can come on Sunday afternoons at one to three here at WG Jones, there's a nursery down this down the road that, uh, towards the office. And um, we propagate plants to, um, for outreach programs and for demo gardens. And those, yeah. <laughs> And those and those are approved for the master naturalist as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is um, eight thirteen, and I'll adjourn, adjourn the general meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank Apologize.